For our next speaker, we uh, journey from the frozen Arctic to uh, yet another uh, relatively poorly understood uh, set of ecosystems on the planet, uh, those of the open ocean. Uh, Dr. Uh, Kelly Benoit Bird has really been in the forefront of developing new techniques to help us um, see and understand uh, what is in these open water environments uh, through new types of uh, optical and acoustic uh, instruments, uh, ways to uh, develop under or understand uh, systems that we haven't really been able to see previously. Um, her work is really changing our understanding of how ocean animals, including zooplankton, fish, squid, seabirds, marine mammals, make their living, and the important role of spatial and temporal variability in these open ocean systems. Uh, Kelly received her bachelor's at Brown University, did a PhD in zoology at University of Hawaii at Manoa, spent a year as a postdoc at the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology, and then joined uh, those of us at Oregon State University uh, in Corvallis. Uh, she is soon to be headed to the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, much to our loss at OSU, but Ambari's gain. Uh, Kelly has also received uh, recently a whole slew of very prestigious awards, really highlighting the importance of her work uh, ranging from uh, a MacArthur Fellowship uh, to most recently um, a U.S. or a U.S. Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers. Uh, in addition to doing exciting cutting-edge science, uh, Kelly spends a lot of her time uh, interacting with public audiences and with school children, especially middle school and high school students, uh, through the TED Ed program. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to welcome Kelly to the stage. Uh, please join me in welcoming her. Kelly? Thank you, Jane, for the introduction and the wonderful invitation to be here today. Uh, and somehow you are seeing a different version of the talk than you were intended, so excuse me for just a second here. So you just heard from Fiamma how the flow of physical energy controls the environment in the Arctic and indeed the entire Earth system. Similarly, the flow of biotic energy through an ecosystem is a key characteristic of its structure and function and is indicative of its overall health. So one way that we think about the biotic energy flow in, in the world is as a pyramid. This idea comes from Lindemann's uh, seminal work in the 1940s and indicates the idea that because of trophic inefficiencies, we have increasingly fewer organisms as we move up through a food web. One of the other things that this implies is that changes in one step in the food chain can have effects on the other. For example, if we increase the available sun, we might increase the biomass of plants in the system, and we might expect that each of the other steps in this food web would also increase so that we'd get a bigger pyramid. Unfortunately, it's never this simple. And that's largely because we don't um, understand the linkages. Between these, they're not quite as simple as um, just eating the thing below you. And it's these mechanisms that are really critical in determining how the changes that we see in an ecosystem are translated up through the food web. And so today, what I'd like to talk about is how we're beginning to understand some of the mechanisms connecting organisms within the oceanic food web. But the challenge that we faced as oceanographers is that this is typically our perspective on the ocean. We're either sitting on the beach or most of us bobbing around in a boat, getting a very limited view of just the surface of the waves. And to get beneath them requires that we use different sensing tools than we are typically used to. Vision doesn't get us very far. And so in my work, we primarily use acoustics. Um, because the sound travels very well in seawater, it lets us get a much bigger footprint to our observations. We do this by sending out a pulse of sound that's made up of a variety of different pitches here indicated by color. And we interpret the returns, both the time and the uh, frequency composition, to tell us something about the targets and where they are. So in the case of the dolphins that you see here, the signal we get back will look very much like the one we sent out with all the different colors here or frequencies represented evenly. 
But if we were to sample a squid that's the same size as those dolphins, we would get a different view. We'd get the low frequency information back strongly. We'd, we'd lose about half the energy at the higher frequencies. And that's quite in contrast to the little krill that these animals are eating, where we get only the high frequency information back. And so we can combine this information to say what kinds of organisms we're looking at, where they are, how many there are, and how they're distributed relative to each other, and use this to address how organisms are interacting in the sea. Using these tools, as well as a long history of more traditional techniques, we find that there isn't a whole lot of food in the ocean. Even the coastal ocean, which we think of as a food-rich habitat, only about two parts out of every million particles of water is actually uh, available energy. And that raises a really important problem because in experimental work has shown that animals cannot survive on these average food concentrations in the ocean. If you take a bunch of sardines and you give them the average zooplankton concentration found in the sea where they were captured, they die very quickly. And so this presents an important paradox. And that's what I'd like to address today. Now I want to get back to this little guy, the krill. This is a really important food resource in many of the world's oceans. And even in high latitudes where they get relatively large, we're talking about something that's about 10 centimeters long. And many of the animals that rely on this food resource are um, large animals. For example, the blue whale doesn't get much bigger than that. So we see a really big size discrepancy between these tiny little prey and the predators. And unlike the case of the blue whale, which engulfs huge mouthfuls of these krill at once, sort of negating that, that size differentiation, many of the predators that rely on uh, these prey in the ocean out, outsize them considerably and you must consume them one at a time. I want to put that into a human scale for you and highlight that each one of these krill is about the caloric equivalent to you of a heavily buttered kernel of movie theater popcorn. And in the volume of this room at two parts per million, there'd be one large tub of popcorn to be eaten. And of course, it wouldn't be neatly collected for you in this bucket. You'd have to swim around the entire volume of this room, a la Willy Wonka, picking off individual kernels of popcorn. I think most of you would recognize how hungry you would be if you weren't getting another lunch after that. And so to understand how animals in the ocean are able to cope with this challenge, we spent a lot of time at sea, um, mostly working with commercial fishing vessels um, in this work in the Bering Sea, where we've been conducting samples, um, conducting surveys with acoustics, as well as visual observations, net toes, and physical measurements um, inside that, that uh, rather large box that you see there. And the first thing that we did in this work was to go out and map the, the heck out of everything and say, how many krill are there? to make the maps that we're most traditionally accustomed to making, the same kind of maps that are used in fishery stock assessments. <coughs> and what you can see from this is that there are areas where there are many more krill in red than, than the average, which is shown in purple. This presented a really big problem for us as we were staring at these data, however. You'll notice two small islands that I'm gonna highlight here in the middle of the plot. And these are breeding colonies for those predators that I showed you. And the predator populations on these colonies have been declining rapidly despite decades of protection from human interactions. And this tiny little island here to the south has had an exponentially increasing population. And you can see how that this doesn't really match well with our map of krill because it looks like those northern two islands should be a great place to be. Well, there doesn't look to be very much food near the southern island. And so after scratching my head for quite some time, I started to go back and look at the original data and realized that that average that I was showing you in that previous map is a lousy representation of what these predators really experience because krill are unbelievably patchy. They are obligate swarmers, which means that throughout their entire life cycle, they spend um, in, in really closely spaced clusters. And this is an echogram. This is the rawest form of data that we collect. You can see the seafloor in gray, and the intensity there represents the density of krill. So on this two kilometer section, the areas that are shown in white mean there are absolutely no krill. And the areas that are shown in red often have thousands of krill per cubic meter. In fact, net toes through one of these um, relatively small patches will sometimes bring up krill in the hundreds of thousands, uh, which makes an awful lot of work for graduate students. But in this case, you can see how um, misleading that average concentration is, because if you hit one of those white spots, you'd get absolutely no dinner. And if you were lucky enough to hit one of those uh, red patches near the seafloor, you would be getting a marvelous banquet. 
And so we can replot that same data instead of looking at how many krill there are, ask how aggregated they are, how patchy are they, and begin to see a bit of a different picture. Now that southern island looks like, in fact, it might be a pretty fantastic place to be foraging if you're interested in patchy prey. And so we wanted to understand from the predator's perspective where they chose to go and what it was about those areas that were important in making those choices. But the first thing we had to address was, can we accurately predict where the predators are, where we've observed them? And I'm really excited to say that um, as a biologist, having numbers this high almost never happens. But using information about the habitat and the prey, we were able to say very well where we expected to find these predators that matched well with our observations. And so we could begin to probe these statistical descriptions of predator uh, distributions and ask what it was that allowed us to make those predictions. Was it the habitat, the prey size, or the abundance of prey, those things we've often used in modeling these efforts in the past? And the answer is pretty much not, not at all. But what about prey distribution? That is, how aggregated the, prill, krill, the krill are, how closely spaced they are, and how far apart they are from other patches as well as their depth. Well, about uh, 60 to 80% of our predictive capability came from these measures of distribution rather than the biomass. But this is not uh, really only a perspective at the population level. We were also able to go out and follow individual predators carrying high resolution behavior tags, as well as use acoustics to observe the behavior of some predators like these diving seabirds that leave long trails of um, acoustically resonant bubbles behind them to ask specifically what individual predators were choosing. And this confirmed our conclusion that predators are targeting prey based on its small scale distribution characteristics, not on the biomass that we so often use when we make measurements. In other words, these spatial patterns matter, and this is really critical as we think about managing these species because the fishermen know this as well. They use some of the same um, choice characteristics as these predators, which leads to incredible overlap. And perhaps this really shouldn't be surprising to us because the physical environment, as Fiamma showed you as well, is a really dynamic place with lots of spatial structure. This is a satellite measurement of the phytoplankton or the plant activity at the surface off the coast where you're sitting right now. You may recognize the hook of Cape Cod up there. And you can see hot spots in red and cool spots in blue at a range of different scales, largely driven by the physical circulation. But most of our efforts have been focused on describing this and, and, and treating it almost as a statistical anomaly in these surface waters. Even in the case of the Bering Sea, we're looking at the upper 200 meters. And we really don't understand what's happening in the deep sea. And we have since uh, really the beginning of oceanography described the deep ocean as simple and uniform and slow. And I really wanted to understand if that was indeed the case because so many predators utilize these deep waters. Um, marine mammals, including toothed whales and seals, have evolved remarkable physiological and behavioral characteristics to feed at depths of 1,000 meters or deeper. The repeated appearance of this physiologically challenging and energetically costi costly strategy in obligate air breathers strongly suggests that there are valuable prey resources to be had in the deep sea. And we've been learning from a variety of shallow water systems that valuable means closely packed. And that doesn't fit with our view of the, deep, of the deep ocean. And so I'm gonna focus a little bit today on the work we've been doing with beaked whales. And that's in part because of the intense interactions between humans and these species. Some of you may, may be aware of the news stories of mass strandings of these animals in association with military sonar exercises. And so there's been an increased emphasis on understanding these, um, uh, this group of animals that remains largely unknown. And in fact, during the time of my relatively short career, more than a dozen new species have been identified. And it's pretty shocking to think about the fact that um, and over the last 15 years, we've identified that many new large mammals on the planet. So that should give you an idea of just how little we know about these, um, these hidden species. So we've been working in collaboration with the US Navy in one of their training exercises off Southern California. And obviously, this is an area of intense interaction between humans and, and military activities and these animals. But from a scientific perspective, it also provides a great opportunity. 
This Navy testing range off San Clemente Island has 88 seafloor mounted hydrophones. And so my collaborators have been for a long time using these to track the behavior and habitat use of these animals that make sounds every time that they're foraging. And so they've created um, a, a long history of how these animals use the Navy's range and found significant variation at the submeso scale, a scale that we don't think of process of, of, of variation happening in the deep sea. Um, with animals using the area on the northwest quadrant of the range rather extensively and not using the area immediately to its east much at all, despite the fact that these look largely similar in almost all of our measurements. And so we wanted to understand why these animals might be using these habitats differently and if that understanding could help us mitigate the impacts of humans on the population. And I want to point out that these are pretty small areas. This is about 25 kilometers across, um, representing about half of the range here. And so this is at much smaller uh, spatial scale than we anticipated finding variation in the deep sea. However, we have a challenge. Most of our measurements made from ships are able to detect the primary food for these animals, squid, to a maximum depth of five or 600 meters. And yet we know that these animals are doing most of their foraging at depths between 1,000 and 1,200 meters. And so the first um, part of this effort was to develop a new tool, a platform that could take our typically ship-based instruments down deep in the sea. And in this case, we're using an autonomous underwater vehicle that can carry those, those sensors and then had to autonomize them to be able to be used in this sort of platform. And this is what that vehicle looks like. On the left-hand side, you see the front of the vehicle, a bulging section, and that's what carries our sensors. Um, the transducer that we're using for one frequency is about twice the diameter of the vehicle itself, um, and they told us it couldn't be done. But I'm happy to tell you that, in fact, it has been done, and here, here she is. We call her Dory because she speaks well. And we sent her down into the deep sea and allowed, uh, collected a large number of samples on the distribution of a variety of species, including squid. And again, trying to address why it is that beaked whales use these different areas within the range so differently, and why they keep coming back to this area despite the incredible interactions they have with the um, humans. And the first thing that we found was that the squid were different on the high and low use areas, with much larger squid found in the high use habitats. But that isn't enough to explain the differences that we observe in foraging ecology here. The other big difference is not only in the biomass of squid, but in its distribution. In the low-use habitat, we have a lower biomass. And interestingly, rather than just being sort of randomly distributed, the squid here are actually nearly evenly distributed. Where in the high-use habitat, we have considerably higher biomass, and it is much more aggregated. So we have aggregations at the scale of tens to hundreds of meters, which means that the squid are relatively close to each other when you're within one of those aggregations. And so we have variation in the uh, distribution of biota in the deep sea at scales from about 25 kilometers, spaced by just a few kilometers apart. This is a really sharp transition. And then it's much smaller scales of tens to hundreds of meters. The presence of this heterogeneity at scales of less than 100 meters contributes to the increasing evidence that our view of the deep ocean as homogeneous and static is vastly oversimplified. And these observations of resource structure at scales of 100 meters provides a framework for how we need to study and interpret the behavior of these deep diving predators. So these new tools are really beginning to reveal much about how the ocean works. But I want to go back to that question that drove this research in the first place and ask what impact this might have on the uh, populations and on our management of them. The mode spacing between squid in the high-use habitat was about 50 meters. So that means that an individual beaked whale would have to swim only 50 meters before it could find the next part of its dinner. While in the low-use habitat, the mode spacing meant that these squid were about three kilometers apart. In order to capture 30 prey, which is about what each beaked whale does on a given dive, they'd have to swim about a meter per second in the high-use habitat and put on your jetpacks 50 meters per second in the low-use habitat. We know from tagging studies of these animals that their velocities typically average around three meters per second, but never exceed 10 meters per second. So this is a real problem. We also know that there are differences in size of the squid that they can acquire in these two different habitats with much larger squid found in the high-use habitat. 
But because these squid grow allometrically, that is, they get fatter as they get longer, much more quickly, these long squid have a much greater caloric content. And so we converted these measurements to calorie content and asked, how many squid would you have to eat in order to meet your basic energy needs if you were a beaked whale? And how many dives would it take to get them based on their spacing? Where in the high-use habitat, these animals would have to do one dive a day, um, not accounting for the cost of the dives themselves, if they could capture every prey they encountered. While in a low-use habitat, they'd have to be reaching down a kilometer beneath the surface of the sea nearly 100 times a day where tagged animals can do this maybe 12 times in a given day. These animals are undergoing an, uh, anaerobic activity in order to get this deep. These are incredibly costly. So in the high use habitat, it's clear that these animals can do quite well. We would, uh, expect that they'd have a lot of energy left over for things like reproduction and growth. But they're really going to have a hard time in the low use habitat. And that's not at all surprising given what we saw in our observations, but it does provide us information on what we need to be able to measure to understand where else they might be. We also made measurements of an area immediately adjacent to the range that these animals use as a refuge when human activities are too intense on the range, particularly when there are anti submarine warfare exercises. And we found that in this area, this refuge, they would have to make about 12 dives a day to meet their basic energy needs. And so while it's clear that they could probably handle this for a short periods of time, it doesn't leave them a lot of room for error or a lot left over for things um, that could lead to population stability and growth. And so this provides significant information on how um, we might suggest that the Navy utilize different areas within the range. And um, how they might manage the time constants and, and activity within that. And clearly gives us a reason why these animals continue to come back to an area that is so heavily disturbed. So aggregated resources are absolutely critical to animal survival in the ocean, and I hope I've shown you that today. But I want to give you one behavioral example that I think brings it into sharp relief. What animals do when prey is in fact not aggregated enough? And in the example in the tropics I'm going to show you from Hawaiian spinner dolphins, they actually work together to make aggregated prey, expending considerable cost and um, in, in time in order to be able to make those dense resources. So this is data from a multi-beam sonar that is a three-dimensionally resolving sonar. And this is a, compressed into a top view here where you see each of these yellow dots represents an individual dolphin's lungs. And so there are 20 individuals here grouped into pairs. The color purple you see rep uh, most abundantly represents the average concentration of prey, and each brightness in the color towards white represents a doubling in prey density. So at the peak of this, you'll often see a density increase of a thousandfold. You'll see time in this five minute observation as a moving yellow bar at about eight times real time. So you'll see this group of animals working together in a line to find an existing low density patch of prey, and then sort of bulldozing it together to increase the density of that prey before forming a circle around it to maintain that patch. You'll see individual dolphins here start to break off from that and move into the circle to forage on that dense patch they've just created before moving back to help maintain the patch while other dolphins take their turn and so on until all of the animals in this group have to come up to, take to, the, breath, to, to the surface to take a breath, and you'll see that the, when they stop maintaining the patch, how quickly it begins to break down. Now, we've just observed that in two dimensions because it's easier to think that way, but these animals are in a three-dimensional world, and they need to be able to interact with a column in the prey. And so they each maintain a very specific role in this choreographed dance to maintain that column of prey before getting two or three turns in each foraging bout to forage on these very small prey that they're consuming. To go back to that idea that I presented at the beginning, this paradox that animals cannot survive on the average food concentrations in the ocean, we are now beginning to understand that they, in fact, do not survive on the average concentrations in the ocean. And that understanding is critical for our ability to predict the events of effects of environmental change on our food supply and to mitigate our impacts on sea animals. The new tools and approaches that we're be bringing to bear collectively are helping to reveal hidden secrets and understand the mechanisms driving populations at the scale where energy transfer really occurs, the individual predator and the individual prey. Thanks.
Thank you, Kelly. We now have a few minutes for questions, so please make your way to the microphones uh, and introduce yourself, pose your question, and we will go from there. So I see a couple of people headed for it. Yes, please, go ahead. Uh, Pat Cool, University of Washington. Hi, Kelly, that was Hi, a Pat. fabulous presentation. So I'm very curious about the social behavior that must maintain this group effort to attack the food. So is that also acoustic? So what keeps them in alignment and what allows them to stay in line and then take their turns? What does that? That's a, that's a great question. We've done some work recording the acoustic behavior of these animals, and we anticipated that they would be using uh, lots of signaling to choreograph the group. It turns out that the only signals that they use while use, doing this foraging are echolocation clicks, not that signals we don't typically think of as being used for communication. But they're also signals that are impossible for most of the other predators in the habitat to eavesdrop on. Um, and so a lot of this appears to be cued by triggers and rehearsal rather than by um, active communication throughout the foraging events. Thank you. Interesting. Yes. Hi, I'm Paula Chessy from Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And my question is, what determines the aggregation of the prey? Oh, I'm sorry, can you repeat what that? What determines the aggregation of the prey? Uh, so there are lots of different things that lead to aggregation, and it's a really complex dance for many of these organisms between physics, behavior, and physiology. And it's, uh, when we think about plankton, we often think only about the physical component as we think of these passive drifters, and yet most of these animals are capable of at least um, competent vertical swimming, um, and uh, like the krill, are, are interested in being in groups with each other. And so there's a social component to that in the context of the physical motion. Um, but, but the answer varies a lot from system to system when you get to the specifics. Please. Hi, I'm Susan Hansen from Clark University. Thank you very much for a fascinating presentation. Thanks. You talked about the spatial aggregation of the prey, and I'm curious how much you've looked at the temporal variability in, that, in those spatial aggregates, because obviously the fish are moving around, mm -hmm. and I would assume that the uh, prey are also not stable spatially. Absolutely. Over time. Absolutely, and uh, the prey are trying a, would very... Would say something about the learning uh, for the fish to right. learn where to find and so on? Exactly, and, and I would want to comment and add to that in that the prey are trying very hard not to be dinner, and so they are constantly moving in, in that aim as well. Um, this is an important problem to be someone else's um, meal. It, the time component is one that's really challenging for us to address because we tend to get snapshots of what's happening. We're beginning to address that um, at a variety of different time scales using um, uh, systems that are deployed for extensive periods of time and we can observe things repeatedly. And also through creative ways of, of designing our sampling so that we can do things like follow the predators themselves to let them tell us a lot about the system rather than just going out and randomly sampling uh, throughout the habitat. Uh, but that's a really important component of that, and uh, I think we have a long way to go in particular in addressing that, that component of that, and that's one of the things I'm really excited to be, to be working on now. Kelly, thank you so much for a terrific presentation. Uh, we appreciate it very much.